Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. You have a Bible, I invite you to open it to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 3 this morning. Uh, we're making our, li- our way line by line and paragraph by paragraph through the book of 1 Peter. We've called this series Hope in a World That is Not Our Own. If you're new with us, then we welcome you to the book of 1 Peter. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one located in front of you or under you and one available for you to use. And you can open it to page number 954. If you do not know where the book of 1 Peter is, we'll be in chapters 1 through chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 this morning uh, in our study together. And today we're starting a new chapter, but it's not a new theme, it's not a new subject. And uh, so as we all get there, as we all get to God's word, open it on our laps, we're going to study it together this morning, line by line, paragraph by paragraph. God has a purpose for us, and God has intentions for our lives. Uh, Peter spent all of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two explaining to us our new identity in Christ. And then in chapter two, verse number nine, if you recall, Peter begins to give us the implications of our new identity in Christ. He says in chapter two, verse number nine, but you're a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous life. It says in verse number 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The implication of the gospel and the God's purpose for our lives and for his followers is that we would live a distinct life and that we would show our allegiance to the Lord while we're on this earth. Uh, Peter goes into verse number 11 and he urges followers of Christ how they are to view themselves while on this earth. He uses words like sojourners, exiles. We think of words like gypsies or refugees or vagabonds. He uses words to describe us, sojourners, exiles. And Peter urges the followers of Christ not to give into the passions of the flesh, but to live life showing their good deeds to a watching world. And then in verse number 13, Peter pivots. He pivots and he begins to unpack for us what these good deeds look like. And how our allegiance to the Lord is seen to the watching world. And Peter moves into one of the primary fruits of the gospel. And the the primary fruit that the gospel produces in the transformation of our lives. And it's been a hard thing to study as we've broken it down. Talking about the fruit of submission. And Peter speaks in verses 13 to 17 about submission to governing authorities. In verses... 18 to 25 on submission to servants and to masters. And then we, we see as he continues here, he's, he's describing to us today in our study and the same topic of submission, the context of submission in the marriage relationship, in the marriage relationship. As we get into this this morning, we must be reminded, and it is important for us to be reminded because this is not an easy topic to speak on. We must be reminded that the focus of submission is not government. The focus of submission is not masters. The focus of submission is not husbands. The focus is our allegiance to our new king, our new master, the Lord. And because we are his slaves, because we are his servants, he now has our allegiance. And so we submit to his plans and we submit to his purpose for our lives. The purpose of our submission, as we've learned and as we've read in 1 Peter chapter 2, is that the evil being spoken against Christ followers would be silenced. And that the watching world would see that our lives have been transformed by the gospel. And in our distinct living, the lost world would come to saving faith. And in that, the Lord is glorified. So that's what we've been up to this point, the topic of submission. I love the game of baseball. I love watching, playing, 
the game. I love to play. I love to watch. I love to study it. And uh, I, love, I love the game very much. And I love watching players who play the game with respect and players that play the game with dignity. This past week, one of the game's great players, and even though he's an enemy here in L.A., <laughs> Buster Posey of the San Francisco Giants announced his retirement. And in his public announcement, he mentioned many things about his career. He thanked his parents for teaching him valuable lessons about sports and about baseball. And one of the lessons that he talked about that his parents taught him is that baseball is a tool, that baseball is a platform to make an impact upon lives. And as I heard him say that, I began to think about our study in 1 Peter. I began to think about the topic of submission. As I began to think about it, I thought, you know, submission is a gospel fruit given to us by the Spirit in order that we can have an impact upon lives. Submission is a tool. The relationships of citizen to government, the relationships of servant to master, the relationship of wives to husband is a tool that has been given to us by God so it can have an impact upon unbelievers who are watching our lives. We want to again prove that to be the case this morning. We want to prove that to be true. So with that being said, you should have your Bibles open to 1 Peter, and we'll be reading beginning in chapter 2, verse number 21, so we can capture the context here. And then we're going to move into chapter 3 and be breaking down this morning the paragraph, verses 1 to verse number 7. Chapter 2, verse number 21, and as we read this, remember this is the words of God. For to this you've been called focus on that. For to this you've been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Verse thir- chapter three. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external the braiding of the hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Our big idea that we're going to get this morning, if you're jotting this down in your journal or on your notes this morning, is this right here that we're going to unpack and prove this to be true this morning. Your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation. Your marriage relationship that God has given to you is a tool, it is an example, it is an image to impact lives. It is a tool, it is something given to you to be an opportunity for gospel proclamation. If you read about this in Ephesians chapter 5, you see in verses 22 to verse number 30, if you can maybe jot that reference down and, and do a study on it, Ephesians 5, 22 to 30, we see that, that marriage is an institution that God uses to show the gospel. A marriage is intended to be an illustration of the gospel on this earth. It is a tool that God has given to us so that we can have a picture of the gospel 
as we live. We must understand this as we get into this territory this morning. This passage is a dangerous place for me to go. It has been used by men to downgrade women. It has been used by women to rise in power and superiority over men. And some things we got to understand before we get into this this morning to make sure that we're on the same page is this right here. Men and women are equally made in God's image. If you're looking for a reference, you can jot down Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Men and women are equally made in God's image. Another truth we got to understand, men and women have equal access to salvation. Galatians 3, verse number 28. Men are not spiritually superior to women in any way, shape, or form. You think about it this way. The Son of God, Jesus, is equal to the Father in essence, but he submits to the Father, revealing that he has a different role in the Trinity. The different roles that husbands and wives have do not compete against each other. They complete the image of the gospel to a world that is watching. So the question we have this morning that we're leading with, if your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation, and if that is true, then how does marriage, how does your marriage faithfully proclaim the gospel? I'm going to give you four thoughts this morning, all taking from God's word, verses one to verse number seven. Your marriage faithfully proclaims the gospel when, number one, the wife is distinct in her behavior. Verses one to two. We're gonna read it again, verses one to two. The wife is distinct in her behavior. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. The very first word that begins in verse number one is the word likewise. That's an important word because likewise is drawing us back to everything that has been said on the topic of submission. Likewise, like citizens to government. Likewise, like servants to masters. This topic of submission is continuing. And then he goes on to, likewise, wives be subject. As we've talked every week, subject means submission. The distinct behavior of a wife who's been transformed by the gospel and the distinct behavior of a wife who uses her marriage to proclaim the gospel is submission. Submission is a tool that God uses to impact people. The same is true with citizens to government. The same is true with servants to masters. And the same is true this morning with wives to husband. Submission means to allow yourself to come under the authority of another. The connection here is seen back to, as we've said already, citizens with government or servants with masters. Citizens with government and servants with masters could be placed in a vulnerable position. And every one of you, when we spoke upon submission to government, we think about the vulnerable position we are placed in. When we spoke about servants to masters, we, we think about the vulnerable position we are placed in. But through submission, good deeds are seen. We see in First Peter. Distinction is noticed and the gospel is proclaimed. It is a tool to impact lives. Wives, listen to me. This is not easy for me to preach this morning. As much as the word may rub you the wrong wrong way, you can't run away from it this morning. This topic of submission has been one of the most hardest for our church family to receive, but we cannot walk away from it. Submission to government rubs us the wrong way. Submission to masters rubs us the wrong way. 
Submission is not an easy word for us to swallow, yet Peter is continuing to tell us that this is one of the primary fruits of gospel transformation. We can't escape it. We cannot take out our Sharpies and put lines through it and close our Bibles and daydream the rest of the service. The word is what it is. So we must stop balking at it and making up excuses to why it doesn't apply to us we must let the authority of God's word rest upon us. Likewise, wives, be subject. Then he continues in verse one, to your own husbands. There is one man who has the priority over your life, wife. One man that has the priority over your life. If you're in this this morning and you're unmarried and you think, how does this apply to me? May I just say to unmarried women, God has provided structures that other men will provide oversight, protection, and leadership in your life. For those who are married, there is one man who has priority over your life. It is not your brother. It is not your father. It is not any other man. If you have entered into the sacred vows of marriage, then there is one man who has priority in your life, and it is your own husband. Verse one, he continues. So that even if some do not obey in word. So likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey in word. A wife submits to her own husband no matter his submission. Your submission is not directly connected to his submission to the Lord. It's easy for a wife, and I I hear it a lot, to discredit and to disregard the call of submission when you see the lack of submission in your own husband. And no doubt in this room, there there are many who have husbands who do not obey the word. Some of you have husbands do not, some of you have husbands that do not love Christ at all. The same was the case for the people living in this Roman province that Peter is writing to. Some of you are sitting here right now and you know where your husband is with the Lord. Others see it, you see it. You see clear marks of disobedience in your husband's life. And because of that, because of those clear marks, it is difficult for you to respect your husband and it is difficult for you to submit to them. But God is telling you through Peter that a wife's submission is not off the hook if her husband is not submitting to the Lord. He is saying that your submission is not based upon your husband's submission to the Lord. And here's what we learn from this. The gospel has trained you. Whether you believe it or do it or not, whether the husband obeys or does not obey, the gospel has trained you for submission to your own husband. As we recap upon submission, as we we studied the last three weeks, citizens don't just submit to government when the government is submitting to God. Citizens submit even to wicked government because in doing so, your gospel transformation is noticeable and our gospel transformation is proclaimed. You can't skirt away from that, regardless of what kind of cop-out you try to give. Servants submit to good masters and to unjust masters because in doing so, your gospel transformation is noticeable and our gospel transformation is proclaimed. Wives submit to their own husbands, even if their own husband hasn't submitted to God, because in doing so, her gospel transformation is noticeable and her gospel transformation is proclaimed. So as we study these three illustrations of submission all together, we cannot balk at it. Now, let me say this. There is a noticeable exception that we've spoken about each week on the topic of submission that we've, that we've studied and unpacked. Your, you submit unless your authority is calling you to do something that God forbids you to do. Or your authority is forbidding you to do something that God calls you to do. That applies to government, it applies to masters, it applies to husbands. You say, what is God's reasoning for submission to your own husband? What's God's plan in your submission? What's, what's our hope through this? As we study hope in a world that is not our own, what is our hope through this? Well, notice what your Bible says, what God's word says in verse one. They may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. God's plan through your submission is that your husbands would come to know Christ and that they would walk in obedience to his word. 
That is God's plan in all contexts of submission. Servants and masters, government, husbands. God's plan through our submission is that the lost world would know Christ. That's why we're told in 1 Peter 2.16, live as people who are free. You have one king. You have one master, King Jesus. Not using your freedom as a covering up for evil, but living as servants of God. God intends for you, wife, by the conduct of your life, your attitude, your actions, that you would be a witness for Christ and his redeeming power to your husband and to the eyes that are watching your marriage. That you would be, as verse nine says, a proclaimer of the excellencies of Jesus to your husband and to the watching eyes that are watching your marriage. That your life, wife, would draw your husband to Christ and obedience to the scriptures. How? Verse two. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. In every relationship we have, may our proclamation of the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light be so crystal clear to them that they'd be drawn towards Christ. And this isn't something that we got to walk around with like, woe is me or God is cursing us. No, this is our hope in a world that is not our own. This is our privilege. This is our hope in this world that God wants to use us as an agent of grace in this lost world. You've not just been redeemed to go huddle up in a monastery, but no, we are in the trenches. We are in hostility. We are called saints and soldiers, sons and soldiers. We are placed here to be agents of God's grace to a lost world. Your influence, wives, is one of the most powerful forces upon the life of your husband. So our big idea. Your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation. Number two. Your marriage faithfully proclaims the gospel when, number two, the wife has a different focus. The wife has a different focus. And I know what some of you wives are thinking, why in the world do I get six verses and the man only gets one verse this morning? <laughs> There's been lots of jokes, but I don't got time to unpack them all for you of why God did this. First Peter 3, 3 through 4. First Peter 3, 3 through 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. The wife has a different focus. Let me just say men to you right now. You now have a Bible verse to give your wife when she keeps on buying those Gucci purses <laughs> and she keeps on buying those expensive makeups and those fashionable clothing. This will help your budget, okay, men? <laughs> All humor aside, this is not what it's talking about, okay? Don't go there. Now, now I've known people, and you have too maybe, that use this passage and they don't wear any makeup. They don't wear gold. They don't pay much attention to their clothing. But we must understand the context here. What Peter is assuming is that the women reading this would be in agreement that they have influence over their own husbands and that they'll be in agreement that they can affect their husbands. And when the wives are told that is without a word, Peter's assuming that the woman's mind will go towards her outward beauty to try to get her man to change. Man, let's be honest. Our wives' beauty can have the power to manipulate us. Many great men have been manipulated by the beauty of a woman. And Peter is saying that it isn't about gold in the hair or on the neck or any part of the body looking fancy to try to get your man to change. You're not using the outward externalness of your body to try to manipulate your husband to actions. Peter isn't saying 
that outward beauty and fancy clothing is wrong. What is he saying? He's just saying that the influence of your life upon your husband is not first and foremost external. He doesn't intend for you to try and draw him in or win him in or manipulate him towards obedience by your external beauty. Your ability to win your husband is much deeper than that. God has transformed you. He has transformed you from darkness to light so that inside of you has been completely changed and the gospel has your heart. Your influence upon your husband comes from your heart being changed and now living in submission to God. In verse three, he says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair, the putting on of the gold or jewelry or the clothing you wear. But notice verse four, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. The reason why a godly woman is noticed is not because of her outward beauty, but her inward transformation by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, ladies, listen to me. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. Are you noticeable for the hidden person of your heart? What is it that is most noticeable about you? I was talking to my wife the other day and I was, I was mentioning to her, I, I keep seeing these women walking by in our city with these massive puckered up lips. And I, and I just asked her, I said, babe, I don't understand like how that happens. Like, is that, what is this? Is this something I missed? And she explained to me, they get some kind of treatment. And all I thought after she explained it to me is like, I'm just glad I'm a dude. All right. That's all I thought. <laughs> now we live in a world, we live in a world where women tend to get noticed for all their external qualities. But may you be a woman who seeks to be noticed first and foremost by the redeeming work of the gospel in your life. To young girls in this room, may you not fall into the societal pressure of finding identity in your external beauty. May you not fall into the societal pressure of what beauty looks like. May you seek Jesus above all else and let his transforming power shine from the internal to the external. So ladies, I ask you, what are you noticed for? Is it the external beauty that you seek first or is it the hidden person of your heart? And then verse number four, catch this. With the imperishable, imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Notice the word imperishable in verse four. You know what that's saying? External beauties die. You all can say amen. I get it. Externals age and externals eventually die. Last week, my mom was trying to talk about a product to my wife and she got a part of this, you know, MLM, buy some cream and you become a salesperson and you get money off or whatever they do. She's trying to talk to my wife about these products that keep your skin from aging and I just called it like it is. That is bull. Because no matter what you do, and regardless how hard you try, the wrinkles will come and your skin will fade and die. We are all dying by the moment. But what doesn't change is the gospel transformation of your heart. For all of eternity, your heart will be transformed by the gospel. And so we seek internal above external. May I just say this world values the wrong kind of beauty. The gentle and quiet spirit is a fruit of gospel transformation. And in verse four, he says this, which in God's sight is very precious. No longer are you most concerned about what others think about you or what, what he thinks about you because what is most important to you is what is precious in the eyes of your heavenly father because of the work of the gospel in your life moving you from darkness to light. So our big idea, your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation. 
We said your marriage faithfully proclaims the gospel when the wife is distinct in her behavior, when the wife has a different focus. And number three, your marriage faithfully proclaims the gospel when the wife has a different kind of life model. A different kind of life model. 1 Peter 3, 5 through 6. For this is how whole, the holy, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. If you notice, first of all, the life model given to us in verse five, for this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Ladies, listen to me. The word of God is filled with godly sisters in Christ who modeled what godly womanhood looks like. And these holy women of God were anchored to the gospel and had a deep hope in God. These godly women had hope that God would supply a savior to redeem fallen mankind in the Old Testament. And it was their hope in God and faith in his promises that transformed them into being godly women who submitted to their own husbands. There's always been good examples and bad examples of what kind of woman to be. You can look in your scripture and you can find good examples and bad examples, and that is still true today. And here's what we know. Unfortunately, it is oftentimes the wrong kind of women in our society who make the headlines. And that so many women in the church community that are Christ followers try to model themselves after. Biblical womanhood may seem outdated. Biblical womanhood may seem against the trends of our society. Yet may you remember that the scriptures give us illustrations, principles, and examples of how godly women carry themselves. There are so many biblical women to study. And if you're a woman here, I would encourage you to learn and to study and to meditate and to set your life on godly women in the Bible to model yourself after. Verse six, we're given one of these women. My wife tried to give me a bunch of reasons why Sarah was not someone to follow, but I said, babe, she's in the Bible. Listen to her, all right? Verse six, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. Men, when you leave here, I want you to remind your wives that they call you Lord now. And you all throw up, all right? <laughs> Genesis 18, 12. Genesis 18, 12, you want to mark it down. Genesis 18, 12 is what Peter's referring to. Now, if there was one thing that summarized the life of Abraham and Sarah is that they moved a lot. Like, just go read the life of of Abraham all the way from Genesis 12 and Genesis 13. And you just see them moving and moving and moving as they were following the promise of God. Hey, where are we going, Abraham? I don't know. We're just going to start walking. Well, Abraham, I don't know if I can. God said walk. We're walking. They were following God by faith. And Sarah was hoping in God. And as she was hoping in God, and it seemed time after time, like her husband did not know where he was going, she was submitting to her husband's leadership. Notice verse six, because I know what some of you are thinking, this is scary. Verse six, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, maybe you've never saw this pop out to you when you've studied this before. But what he's talking about is that submission is a fearful thing. It is a frightening thing. And that's why so many have a hard time over at the last few weeks because the topic of submission scares you. Therefore, we balk. So many women think that if I submit, then he will wrong me and he will hurt me. He'll be a dictator over me. I know my husband. He can't handle that much power. I've got to keep him in check. God's word, and, and notice this, God's word does not condone women submitting when there's physical harm at risk. Okay, church family, let's put that out there. This does not mean that you submit when you're demanded to do what God is forbidding you to do or when you are forbidden to do what God has commanded you to do. But Peter is simply acknowledging what all women understand. And that is that, that it is frightening to bring yourself 100% under the authority of your husband. Yet this is exactly what God intends for our marriages. 
Men and women are equal in value, but distinct in roles. If you want your marriage to be what God wants for your marriage to be, then that is that your marriage would faithfully proclaim the gospel and there must be submission from your wife, from the wife. Women, listen to me. Whether you're married or not, whether you're married or not, whether you're a woman in here that is married or not, the gospel transformation that we read about at the end of chapter two calls you to this. Submission is a gospel fruit of a transformed heart. God's design for your submission and you, you adorning yourself with a gentle and quiet spirit is that you'd influence your husband to obey the word and follow Jesus with his life because of the conduct of the wife. It doesn't matter if it's submission to government. It doesn't matter if it's submission to masters or submission to husbands. The focus is not on the authority of man, which we so often chirp about. The focus is on the fruit of the gospel and the will of your heavenly father. You say you have one king, then submit. You have one king, you have one master, you are free from all others, but don't use your freedom as a covering for evil. Serve God with your life and seek to follow his will that he has for you. This is the fruit of a heart that is changed by the gospel. So our big idea, your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation. Number four, your marriage faithfully proclaims the gospel when the husband seeks to honor his wife. Verse seven. Likewise, very same word, likewise, likewise. Going back to the likewise of verse one, connecting it back to submission in chapter two. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Likewise. Likewise here. In chapter seven, husbands, you are commanded. You're commanded to what? Your submission is under the ultimate authority of God. Men, we take orders. We are under God's authority for our life. We submit in the care for our home and the leadership of our wives. As men, we submit for the care of our home and the leadership of our wives, unmarried men. Unmarried men, listen, position yourself now under the authority of God in your singleness. If submission to God is not practiced in your singleness, then you will struggle to be this if God has you to get married one day. So God has called you to this. He enables you to it because of the transformation of your heart and the indwelling work of the spirit of God in your life. As he continues in verse seven, likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way. Live with your wife. Men, do life with your wife. How do we honor our wives? Do life with them. She's not just a roommate. She's a valuable soul that God has entrusted to your care. Date her. Get off your couch, hang out with her. Spend time with her, wake up with her, eat breakfast with her, laugh with her, cry with her, do fun stuff with her. Get out of the garage, get out of the man cave. Don't let your children rob you of your most sacred relationship on this earth. Those moments when there were no kids and you would just date and laugh and flirt and chill And every waking moment, you just couldn't wait to get back to her and spend time together. Never let that stop. Do life with your wife. She is the primary and most important relationship on this earth. The primary and most important thing should not be your job, men. It should not be that hobby, men. It should not be that sport, men. Ladies, I'm letting you in into what we talk about at our men's breakfast, all right? It should not be those 15 fantasy teams you have. Like, good day, men. Live with your wife. Then he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. Understanding way. Men, make it your life's mission to learn your wife and understand her. Know your wife's feelings. Know her needs. Her girlfriends shouldn't know more about her than you do. 
What makes your wife tick? What makes her sad? What makes her laugh? When does she need a night away and you need to get a sitter and take the initiative? How's she doing spiritually, men? Hey, honey, how are you doing spiritually? What are you reading in your Bible right now? Where can you pray for her? When does she need to have a coffee date with you? Men, we have a PhD in our wives. We are students of our wives. We seek to have knowledge and understanding of her. May I just add, not just knowledge of her, but knowledge of who she is in Christ and what she's called to be. Do you have knowledge of who your wife is in Christ and what she's called to be? Yes, men, she is called to be your wife. Yes, men, she is called to submit. But with that being said, men, we do not view verses one through six and be like, see woman, you're called to me. You exist for my pleasure. No, God has gifted your wife. God has gifted your wife. Do you know what they are? God has equipped her with a set of skills. Do you know what they are? God has a spiritual calling for your wife. Do you know what it is? And I'm just calling out to men. May men, may we speak life into the gifting that God has given our wives. May we be her biggest cheerleader. And may she go farther and faster and make more of an impact for the kingdom of Jesus because she has you as her husband. Verse seven, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, weaker vessel isn't calling women weaker in some demeaning way. I've had so many women over the years say, I just think God doesn't like women. That is so far from true. And I'm sorry you've ever felt that if you're a woman in this room. This is in reference to God's unique structure in his design. I know we live in a society that demonizes manhood, but God in his design has made men to be strong. God in his design has made men to be protectors. Biblical manhood, biblical masculinity, even though it may be looked down upon by many today, that is God's unique structure in his design. This doesn't mean that women aren't strong. I was raised by a very strong mom. My wife is a very strong woman. Many of you ladies in this room are incredibly strong women. The the idea here is not to demean your strength. The idea here is actually opposite. It is to call your husband up as a protector. It is to bring out the warrior in your husband. It is calling your husband to protect the wife, to protect her emotions, to protect her feelings, to protect her physically, to protect her weaknesses, to lead her spiritually, to be the spiritual shepherd in your home. As men, we proclaim that God has transferred us from darkness to light by how we care for our wives by how we live with them, by how we know them, by how we honor them, by how we protect them. Men, we should not take advantage of our wives. We must seek out ways to love our wives. We must seek out ways to care for her. We must seek out ways to go above and beyond in our services to her. This is what the gospel has transformed our hearts to be. Men, we submit to God first. And some men have a problem caring for the wives because God is not an authority in your life. Men, we submit to God first. And from that submission, we love our wives. We provide for her out of strength and conviction. Listen, men, it'll be a joy for your wife to live in the design of God if you will lead with this love for her that comes from a transformed heart by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse seven, why? Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Hey, she's your sister in Christ. You're both recipients of gospel grace. She's not less than man. So what do we do? We help each other grow in grace. We help each other seek Jesus to be number one out of all other things in our life. Forever we will be with them in eternity. They are heirs of grace with us as men. And then he concludes verse seven, so that your prayers may not be hindered. If you think you can go to your heavenly father in prayer while you've been neglecting his daughter, you got it wrong, men. Now God loves you. 
There's no condemnation with your heavenly father when you sin if you're in Christ Jesus, but the relationship with you and your heavenly father is breached when we take advantage of his daughters. I'm a girl dad, I got four daughters. If some boy is a dirt bag to one of my daughters, he's gonna have a problem with old daddy Nick one day, all right? And what a silly illustration that even is because God cares for us and his daughters in a way that I can't even imagine. So our big idea, your marriage relationship must be seen as an opportunity for gospel proclamation. What's our learn to live as we pack this up? One, have you seen gospel transformation in your life? I'm talking about in the context of submission over the last three weeks. Have you seen gospel transformation in your life or is all there is is rebellion? I am free. I live as myself. I'm, I'm the ruler. I do what I want to do. Have you seen gospel transformation in your life? Has there been a time in your life where you've realized that you were lost and that you were separated from God, but that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life that you could not live? And that Jesus Christ paid a substitutionary death that only he could pay and take the full wrath of God. And three days later, Jesus Christ rose in a victorious resurrection. Has there been a time in your life where you rejected your self-ruled life, your man-made way to get to heaven, your sin-controlled life, and said, Jesus, I'm turning to you to be my savior? If you've never done that, then the gospel call this morning is give your life to Jesus. Maybe that song we sung in worship, Break Down All My Religion, needs to be your song as you leave this place today. Have you seen gospel transformation in your life? Number two, if you're in a life group, I hope this question is a major part of your discussion this week. And if you're having coffee this week with some men or some ladies at the church, I hope we open up this question. What are your greatest struggles in marriage? Talk about it. Three, where can you grow in gospel proclamation? Maybe even right now, you got to lean over to your spouse and say, you know, honey, our marriage is not proclaiming the gospel like it should be doing right now. And we got to have some discussion and then we got to have some accountability and some pursuits. And then men, you take the leadership and lead your home to grow in gospel proclamation. Amen. Amen. May we proclaim the, the, the message of the gospel through the relationship that he has given to us in our marriage. And I pray that to be the case as we humbly submit to the authority of God's word this morning. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. You're such an amazing God.